Good afternoon. Welcome to our September 7th policy session of the Phoenix City Council. I will now call this meeting to order and ask that the clerk call the roll. Councilwoman Ansari. Here. Councilman DeCicio. Councilwoman Guardado. Here. Councilwoman O'Brien. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Vice Mayor Garcia. Here. Mayor Gallego. We'll begin with council information and follow up requests. We have any council members with information or follow up requests. Mayor Councilman. Guardado. I do mayor. This is council. We'll go to Councilman Guardado followed by Councilman O'Brien. Thank you, mayor. Um, first, um, I not the person that likes to start on a, on a sad note. Um, but yesterday, I, I received a phone call from our chief, Cara, um, that we've lost um, one, one of our firefighters, um, Miguel, Miguel Angulo. Um, he worked out of the Maryville, at the, out of the Maryville precinct. Um, he was in Station 25. I want to send my, my condolences um, to the whole fire department and to his family. Um, he worked he worked for, for many, many years um, in the department and dedicated and dedicated a lot of time to our constituents. So just want to say, um, give my condolences to the family um, and, to, and to our department. And I know that we also saw lost another public, pu public safety servant. Um, his name is Sergeant Tom Craig. And just want to send my condolences um, to the families. Um, and let them know that they will be in our in our prayers. Um, so with so with that, I will move with with other stuff. Um, I would like to invite all of our neighbors in the area around Homestead Park to join my office this evening for a community meeting to discuss ideas on activating the park and to provide feedback on future amenities. We will have partners from our school district, our parks department, Maricopa County Public Health. Rehoboth, Cass, and many more. The event will start at 5 p.m. and run until 8 p.m. I want to give a special thanks to Violence Impact Project and the Ocotillo Glen Neighborhood Association for helping to coordinate the event and engage our community. And lastly, um, I would like I would like to invite everyone and announce that Mexican Baseball Fiesta is coming to American Fields in Maryville on September 23rd. We will have Hermosillo playing against Obregón. This will be an open air event and we will have COVID testing and vaccination events leading up to the game. We will also have these services available the day of the, at the same time as the game is playing. Um, we, um, one, one of the, one of the bands that's going to be playing is the band that put together a song for the Suns um, when they were in the middle of the playoffs. So definitely um, it's going to be a full event. It's going to be, I think everyone will have a great time. If you would like additional information and ticketing details, find me on social media and I will be post posting around the event um, and letting people know how we can facilitate some of those tickets. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman O'Brien. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I am going to start with some good news. And on August 27th, uh, we were hosted the longstanding tradition in District 1 of the community breakfast at the Double Tree Hotel, which was attended by more than 70 District 1 residents. And I want to thank our speakers who attended the meeting, Lisa Huggins Hubbard from Neighborhood Services as well as Dustin Daft, who is the real estate manager from Quick Trip Corporation. Um, they're uh, great partners. Commander William Wick Wickers from Cactus Park Precinct, Commander Darren Viner from Black Mountain Precinct, and Lieutenant Mark Schweikert from Public Transit Bureau. Uh, the District 1 residents found the information that was shared uh, very relevant and very much was appreciated. And to keep the engagement going, we will be hosting a District 1 monthly meeting, but we'll alternate locations every month. Uh, this month, we will host one in the northern part of our district to accommodate those residents up there. 
and in October we'll move back to the Devil Tree in the Metro Center area. Um, the latest information on these community meetings can be found by just subscribing to our District 1 newsletter at phoenix.gov slash district1. I also really want to thank the Streets and Trans Street Transportation Department, Keeney and staff, who hosted a virtual meeting on September 2nd to inform residents along 55th Avenue between Pinnacle Peak and Happy Valley Roads about an upcoming street maintenance project and opportunity for bike lanes. Uh, our office has received a handful of emails stating how much that meeting was appreciated, uh, as well as the project information shared uh, and the chance for our residents to uh, provide feedback. So a really huge thank you to the Street Transportation Department. And I'd like to um, finish up just with my sincerest condolences to both the police and fire departments who both lost members of their families this weekend. And my prayers and condolences go out to their family and friends uh, of these brave public servants. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also wanted to start off by sharing my condolences for both the fire department um, and the police department for their losses. Um, our thoughts and prayers are absolutely with you. Um, we also had a horrible accident in my district um, where a downtown Phoenix ambassador biking home from work um, was unfortunately struck on Fillmore Avenue. The good news is that he is recovering, but he has a long journey ahead. Um, and we know that this happens across Phoenix and Levine. Um, to another gentleman on August 31st, uh, who sadly passed away. Uh, so my thoughts are with the families affected. So I'm looking forward to talking about safe transportation implementation later today. Um, a couple of updates from our side when it comes to heat relief. Um, I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, um, but um, happy to see that the cooling bus um, that uh, we help bring to right outside the human services campus um, continues to be very effective. Um, in August, it was visited over 5,103 times. Um, we also worked with the county as well as the Human Services Campus to bring another heat relief station um, that's located at 9th Avenue in Jackson, open from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and I think uh, one of the most helpful pieces of that cooling of that heat relief station is the portable portable bathrooms um, and the hand sanitation stations. Um, so if there's one thing that I personally would love to see more of. Um, is extending those hours, especially for the bathrooms, as we know that that can be a really, really helpful solution for people experiencing homelessness. Um, as always, thank you so much to city staff for working so diligently, and thank you so much to the Human Services Campus and community leaders who are actually on the ground day in and day out making sure um, that these stations are working and we know that their work is saving lives. Um, we've also had a number of community events over the past month or so. Um, we had a meet and greet um, uh, for District 7 residents with a uh, local restaurant, Testal, with about 30 residents in attendance. It was really cool to hear the personal story of the, of the founder of the restaurant, Fernando Hernandez, um, where he shared how he create, uh, came to create a space where he could share his Mexican culture through food. Uh, we've also participated in a number of other events, including a principal's coffee at Cuban Elementary School, where I was able to hear from residents in the district, specifically also in regard to street safety and transportation um, issues for their kids. Um, also very excited to share, finally, um, that we had our first meeting of the Electric Vehicle Ad Hoc Committee. Um, First public meeting was held on August 9th. This is the mayor's new ad hoc committee, which I am um, really excited to be chairing. Strong group of local experts and community leaders on the committee. Um, and as we await the passage of one of the largest infrastructure bills uh, in our country, I'm really excited uh, about these efforts locally to create a roadmap for EV infrastructure. There are gonna be three subcommittees for the ad hoc. Um, one is looking at equity and affordability. The other is looking at city fleets and finally on infrastructure. And we have our first um, subcommittee meeting this Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any additional council member updates? Any additional updates? All right, uh, I will provide an update as well. Want to uh, join my colleagues in mourning the passing 
of the members of the city of Phoenix family, thanking them for their service. It's been a tough time for us. COVID continues to be very difficult in this community. And we've also had just a very difficult summer with a lot of record setting and difficult events. So we appreciate everyone who's out there working hard for our community. On the COVID side, we do have uh, mobile vaccination available and we do have um, real challenges in this community with not more than 90% of our hospital beds are occupied at this moment, 32% ICU beds occupied with COVID. So it continues to be a challenge and we appreciate uh, folks who are out there getting vaccinated and helping others get vaccinated or who are taking other safety precautions. It is certainly a tough time to be out there and, and everyone is looking forward to having this virus behind us, but unfortunately it is not so far. Um, I do want to thank those who reached out to me. I recently lost my mother and I just want to appreciate those who um, sent words of inspiration or, or prayers my way. Really appreciate that as well. Um, on a happier note, uh, Lana Shatova to our uh, Jewish community and, and Happy New Year to all those who are joining in celebration. Um, may it be a wonderful new year. And then in closing, I want to congratulate Mayor Tom Barrett of Milwaukee, who defeated me in a bet. Uh, we have sent uh, us brewing urban cookies, a bunch of other treats out to Milwaukee. And, and in congratulations to the Bucks. Uh, he, uh, Mayor Barrett did propose betting a Harley Davidson, and I am glad I did not take him up on that as uh, it would be quite expensive to be paying up on, on that bet. But I feel like next year is going to be our year. And uh, Mayor Barrett may be elsewhere by then. He has been nominated to be the next United States ambassador to Luxembourg. So we wish him well wherever his future may take him and, and congratulate him for winning the bets. Although we are very optimistic for next year. With that, we uh, do not have a call for an executive session today. So I will turn to our city manager. Do you have any reports or updates before we go to agenda item one? Uh, thank you, Mayor. We will have a, a, a more extensive budget update in two weeks. So at this point, I don't have any uh, further information today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. We will then go to agenda item one, which is accelerated pavement maintenance program update. Uh, this item is on our agenda at the suggestion of Councilman Jim Waring, who has been uh, quite the advocate for making sure we do a good job maintaining our city streets and preventing potholes. So I will turn to Councilman Waring for a few words. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor, I appreciate it. Um, I, I suggested this because I, I thought it was something that was very positive. Uh, uh, Keeney, I'm sure he's there listening, um, probably gets sick of hearing from me. Uh, but I will say in 2018, it was the fall of 2018, uh, some of us were not on the council at that point, but uh, you know, Sal DeCicio was instrumental in getting this done, um, as well as Deb Stark and uh, Laura Pastor. I think we just felt in a bipartisan way, we needed to do something about our streets. And Mayor, I think I can now say, I think Kenny will back me up on this, we've now paved more streets during your mayoralty than has ever been done before. Maybe he'll correct me on that, but I, I do think that's something to be proud of. I uh, also certainly appreciate Felda Williams was mayor at the time and she was instrumental in this and getting this on an agenda. So as you suggested, it was something I felt very strongly about, but certainly uh, Sal and the other guys certainly um, you know, paved the way, no pun intended. I will say for Keeney, we have more streets in district two than any other district. I think it's 740 miles roughly of the roughly 5,000 miles of streets. Uh, you know, we don't have light rail or other modes of transportation. We just have the streets. So I had concerns and I will say since we have done this and the Ford as well, um, Keeney and his staff have just been phenomenal. Uh, I don't wanna leave somebody out, but, but Sasha Perez and Mark Glock and Chris Yule, Mark and Chris have gone out. I don't know how many hours I spent in their trucks uh, driving around looking at streets. All I can say from my perspective in District 2 is I think the residents have really appreciated it. So, Mayor, uh, my my congratulations to you for, for sticking with this and, and keeping everybody on task. I just think this was a critical infrastructure need 
And I just think uh, this report is going to show that we made the right decision, that we've moved things forward for our citizens in a positive way. And I just really appreciate, uh, particularly the members, you know, who were there to vote for it a few years ago. So thank you, and uh, thanks for the time. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It is certainly good news to have better paved streets. We actually had a marathon reach out to the mayor's office. They said we had taken all the traffic barricades and we were renting them all for our street paving and they couldn't find enough to have the marathon. So <laughs> it's a, a different take on a problem, but definitely illustrated what, what a commitment to street paving that we have had in the city of Phoenix. And, and I, I think we'll hear about 12% of the entire street network in just one year. So with mayor, that, I will turn I, I it say, over. Or, oh, Mayor, can I say one Please. more thing to that end? Uh, slightly humorous, but it's actually true as well. I think it was Deb I was speculating with when we made this vote, like how long would it be before people were complaining more about barriers and barricades and uh, traffic cones and stuff than they were about the crummy streets? And I think it was pretty much exactly three months. I would argue that's, that's still a good problem to have. Um, but the fact that it was so noticeable that it did get commented on that we were doing so much more work. I, I thought, all kidding aside about what you were saying about the marathon, I, I do think there's probably a lot of real truth to it. And, um, you know, I, I think that's actually in long term, certainly a good thing for us. Yep, it is making a noticeable difference and the written marathon was able, able to go forward. So uh, we are solving multiple problems. And I'll turn it over to two men who have been very busy solving those problems. We'll uh, start with Deputy City Manager Mario Paniagua and let him introduce his team at the table. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councilman Waring. Uh, what a great introduction to this item to, to talk about some great news about what's going on with our uh, street paving. Uh, this is, as you know, such a, an important issue for all of our community, whether you're driving on the roads, using transit, walking, using a wheelchair, riding a bike. Our condition of our streets is extremely important to all of our um, residents, all the people that work in Phoenix and that visit Phoenix. So this is a, this is a very important item. And with me, uh, uh, as, as you all know and love, is Kini Knutson, our street transportation director. Also, Chris Ewell, as, uh, as Councilman Wary mentioned, uh, is here to talk about the, the pavement management program. Uh, that, that he's overseeing now. Uh, the uh, accelerated pavement management program, maintenance program that the council approved a couple of years ago has uh, made a substantial difference uh, in, in the condition of our streets. The program has won uh, City Manager's Excellence Award and an industry award for uh, the, the community outreach dashboard system that was put in place. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, First, a little bit of background and context as we kick this, up, this presentation off. Our primary funding source for the construction and maintenance of our city streets in Arizona is the 18 cents per gallon uh, gasoline tax. The, uh, the same level of funding has been in place since 1991, so that's 30 years uh, unchanged at that level. Um, today, a dollar is about half the value it was in 1991. Uh, and in that meantime, the, we've grown to the fifth largest city in the U.S. We, we used to have at that time about 3,800 miles of streets. Now we've got close to 5,000 miles of city streets. Um, as, we, as we talked about inflation, fuel efficiency uh, also means that uh, driver, uh, cars are, are driving more on our roads and paying, paying a little bit less in terms of that, that dollars per gallon. So, uh, so it really affects how we've been able to maintain our city streets. Uh, on top of that, there was the, the Great Recession, and so we also had a huge decrease in that gas tax funding as a result of the, the Great Recession. Um, you see here, in two, back in 2007, we received about $134 million a year uh, for that gas tax funding, and it plummeted for several years and bottomed out in 2012. And I, and I show that just to demonstrate uh, how devastating that revenue decrease was to our city streets. That's really where we, we had the, the money for our pavement maintenance 
and we were not able to invest what was needed to, to keep our roads up to date. Um, even though it's climbed back in present day to the pre-recession levels, there are so many years that were piled on top of each other uh, with substantial revenue loss that it was a major, major hit to our streets. So back in 2015, uh, voters did approve Proposition 104, which is we often refer to it as T2050, uh, transportation sales tax, that did add in about 17 to 18 million dollars a year for street maintenance. So that has helped uh, as we as we try to get back on track. However, the pace that we needed those funds uh, because of the backlog that was created. Uh, it just it, it just demonstrated a, a, a bigger need for us, and so we fast forward a little bit to 2018, and this is this is when the council approved the advancement of 200 million dollars in streets T2050 funding over five years to accelerate pavement maintenance, and that's really where we've seen some great results uh, being able to uh, to pave our streets. And so I'm going to turn it over to Keeney Knutson to talk about all the success that we've had in that program. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, I'm excited to be here today and to share with you our updates on the accelerated maintenance program. It was a little over two years that I spoke to you last about this program and we've made a great deal of progress since then. Today I'll share some great work that has taken place over the last two plus years. Here's what I plan to cover, uh, talk a little bit about our achievements, uh, some of the innovation we've done throughout the program, uh, communication that we've done with the community and our partners, uh, recent projects that we've just completed across the city, and then uh, covering up and wrapping up with some still to come, uh, what we have left in the program. So first we're going to dive into our achievements and what we've accomplished. So let's first talk about our progress on paving more of our city streets. This is a five-year program that was scheduled to continue through fiscal year 2023. So far, through August of this year, we've completed 83% of our planned accelerated pavement maintenance work. And we've managed to do this in only 60% of the allotted time. So really true success and we've been able to move faster than we, we anticipated initially. So when we began this pavement, um, accelerated pavement effort, our goal was to reach an accelerated um, pavement miles of 630 miles over five years. Now looking at this by the numbers, here's a breakdown of our fiscal year progress. Uh, these numbers show that a cumulative amount of paving done over our program thus far. So you see us inching closer and closer uh, through the way, th towards that 630 mile threshold. Um, you might recall that late last fiscal year, we uh, had an important milestone that we passed with getting to 500 miles through our accelerated pavement maintenance program. So we're excited about what we've been able to accomplish thus far. So as we've been paving, we've also managed to be able to upgrade some of our street infrastructure in two key ways. First, we've been able to complete pavement preservation work, which includes upgrading our curb ramps to the most current ADA accessibility standards. So far, we've replaced more than 13,000 ADA ramps across our city. Second, as we repave our street, we also have to restripe it. And we've been able to do that uh, through creating 83 new bicycle lane miles, and also restriping, we've been able to create 35 miles of buffered bike lanes, either as we restriped existing lanes, bike lanes, or created new bicycle lanes. Our work on the Accelerated Pavement Maintenance Program has also provided an opportunity to be both creative and innovative in a number of areas. One of the most significant areas of innovation was in our initiation of our Cool Pavement Pilot Program, which was launched in the middle of our accelerated paving effort. Last summer, we installed one cool pavement location in each council district and another location selected by the mayor for a total of nine areas that received cool pavement. This map shows the location of these nine areas across the city. On the left hand side, you see the northern portion of our city, and on the right hand side, you see the southern portion of our city. And those red uh, squares denote where those cool pavement locations are. So the cool pavement pilot was focused on reducing uh, surface temperatures of the road to help address urban heat island impacts as well as help better protect our roadways. With the pilot, the city installed more than 5.6 million square feet of cool pavement treatment across our city streets. So I, I don't want to bury the lead here, but as we completed this pilot, we soon discovered that what our pilot made Phoenix's program the largest cool pavement demonstration effort across the entire United States. It wasn't something we were trying to, but it's something we just happened to as we were doing uh, great work for our community. 
The accelerated program has really focused on our uh, extensive treatment of our, the most extensive treatment we do for pavement maintenance, our asphalt overlays. In this process, we first mill or grind away the top inch of existing pavement before repaving the street. The resulting asphalt mills, millings are a byproduct of our overlay process. Those millings typically ended up in a landfill. So with the amount of paving we were doing with our accelerated program, streets decided to stockpile the millings for reuse. The millings can be and are used for dust control and alleys, but more recently, we have incorporated the millings in recycled asphalt and used it for new paving projects, reducing the city's cost by up to 10%. The cost savings are a great benefit to the city, but I would also note the environmental benefits associated with these millings not ending up in the landfill. Through this process keep, of keeping our public, our partners, and stakeholders engaged and informed about the accelerated program, it has been a top priority for our department. Community engagement has been critical throughout our work on the accelerated paving program, and it began early in 2019, and it continues through today. And some of you might remember the interactive input tool we developed and launched at the beginning of this effort to, to allow the public to tell us where they thought we should focus our paving activities. And we got a lot of interaction and input from our, our residents who were very um, passionate about their streets, as we all know. And through those initial efforts, we conducted over 80 public meetings and met with nearly 12,000 residents. In addition to reaching out to the community, we also emphasize coordination and collaboration with our city de sister city departments to avoid conflicts on city and developer-driven projects. Um, excuse me, um, back up here. Um, and also with the contracting community to help ensure we had the necessary resources to complete the program. We also worked with ADOT to coordinate paving work around fee freeway construction schedules and also with our utility partners to avoid unnecessary cuts into our streets following our paving projects. We also knew that communication and collaboration needed to be continuous, so we developed tools to make this a reality. An example of this was the in-house creation of our pavement maintenance management da dashboard, which provides a public an easy way to access information about upcoming or completed paving projects. This short video um, that you're watching here, although the sound's not on there, it provides a brief overview to our residents on how to use the pavement maintenance dashboard, ma maintenance dashboard if they'd like to see what's going on in their neighborhood. And that's, this is not something that's just for our accelerated program. It's going to be something that we're going to continue to have active and involved and available to our residents, to our utility partners, other members of the public throughout um, as we continue our paving program now and into the future. We also knew that um, communication and collaboration, I'm sorry, we also have actively utilized social media platforms to publicize and create, celebrate this completion of much-needed paving work like this overlay on the stretch of 15th Avenue. In return, we have received some great heartfelt feedback from our residents, like this one from Joe, who expressed gratitude for the work we did in his neighborhood. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Ewell, our Deputy Director over Street Maintenance, to share some photos and updates on, about some recently completed paving projects. Thank you, Keeney. Mayor and members of the Council, um, it's my pleasure to share with you some before and after photos of some projects that we recently completed during this uh, current paving season. Some of these areas you'll, you'll recognize, so in District 1, a 51st Avenue from Bell Road to Loop 101, before and after. In District 2, Carefree Highway from I-17 to 7th Avenue. And in District 3, Shea Boulevard from Tatum Boulevard to 56th Street. Looks so much better now. And in District 4, 19th Avenue from uh, Indian School to Camelback Road, very heavily traveled area. Beautiful now. And in District 5, from um, 35th Avenue from Camelback Road to Bethany Home Road, Again, very beautiful section of roadway. And in District 6, Chandler Boulevard from Desert Foothills Parkway to 24th Street. District 7, Lower Buckeye Road from 35th Avenue to 27th Avenue, heavily uh, traveled corridor in our uh, industrial areas. And in District 8, 32nd Street from McDowell Road to Thomas. I'll turn it back over to Keeney to talk about more what's to come. Thanks, Chris. As we, well, as we have highlighted, we've made some amazing progress with our accelerated paving program, but we still have more work to go. First, we have another 36 miles of arterial street asphalt repaving to do in fiscal year 2023, and this will provide much-needed maintenance for our major streets and make them smoother and more enjoyable. 
But as mentioned earlier, our efforts on the accelerated program were focused on our major streets. However, the, our local and residential streets did not seem to see the same level of accelerated maintenance resources. Although we are performing pre pavement treatments on our local streets, we do not have the asphalt mill and overlay treatments for those streets until fiscal year 2024. And finally, I anticipate that we will be soon launching phase two of our cool pavement program. With our initial pilot, we have been working with uh, Arizona State University on research and evaluation, and we have seen positive results, which we will be sharing publicly later this month. But when launched, I anticipate phase two will at least double what we've already accomplished with our initial uh, phase one of the pilot program. So I'm going to turn it over to Mario to take you through the next slide. Oh, sorry. Actually, I did want to not uh, do, forget to do this. Um, through this whole process, I just wanted to um, exp express sincere gratitude and thanks. I know that when uh, getting um, kudos like from Councilwoman, Councilman Waring or even Councilwoman O'Brien earlier, um, it's great to hear, um, but it is truly representative of great teamwork to be able to go and do this kind of work. Um, and, and this kind of a program is no, no doubt um, that exemplifies great teamwork um, from our city staff, from our city, sister city departments, from our contracting community, from the mayor and council, um, to our residents, all of those who helped make this successful. So I'm going to turn it over to Mario to take you through the recommendation. Thank you, Keeney. So mayor and council, uh, that really wraps up the presentation, but today's uh, presentation is not just a celebration of what we've been able to accomplish, but we do have an action item that we'd like to request from you. Uh, Keeney mentioned the challenges we, we have with funding upcoming for the local streets, the neighborhood streets uh, that, that our homes or residential areas are around. And so we do have some funding available from the gas tax that was a little bit more than what had been projected. We have about $18 million that is available that we would like your approval to allocate for the pavement of the local streets in fiscal year uh, 2022 and fiscal year 2023. What that would allow us to do is to do mill and overlay of, of a complete quarter section in every council district uh, every year for the next two years. So, so essentially um, a quarter sections, uh, 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 about a million dollars and we can do about nine quarter sections per year for the next two years with those funds. And so with that, we're happy to answer any questions, but we would like to, uh, to get Council's action on this request today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first off, I want to thank Keeney and all his great staff. Um, I remember he came to a Moon Valley meeting and talked about the accelerated pavement program and talked about the interactive map. The next day when he went on the map, 7th Street was exploding. We need to pave 7th Street. So it worked, getting out to the neighborhoods, it really worked. We really did hear from a lot of people. Um, I think that um, I'd like to see this continued. If you need someone to make a motion, I'd be happy to make a motion. Um, I think we can continue this terrific work. Just like the staff hearing compliments from residents, I too have heard those compliments and everyone is very appreciative. And I think Jim's right. We didn't get a lot of complaints about the paving. It was more about the non-paving and the maintenance of the road. It's so much better now with our program. So with that, I'd be happy to make a motion recommending what staff suggests. Second, Mayor. Second, Mayor. This is Perfect. We have a motion from Councilwoman Stark and a second from, I think I heard Councilman O'Brien first. May have been Councilman Waring as well. Uh, we'll let the city clerk decide. Uh, Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I also want to start by saying um, I want to thank Kinney and his entire team for their tireless work throughout the year, but especially during our paving season. Kinney always comes to the table with solutions when looking at roadway safety, increasing transit options, and, and implementing innovative strategies such as our cool pavement program to meet larger strategic goals. The accelerated pavement program has been wi wildly popular throughout District 5. I can tell you that I had a 45 minute conversation the other day with a constituent on how happy she was um, that her street had gotten paved and that, that we had the cooling pavement program and that she sees all the efforts that are being put in our in our in our streets. Um, so definitely our, our constituents are noticing um, the 
the difference out there and, and, and I think people are very happy um, to see the changes that are, that are happening. Um, so with this accelerated payment program, I, I think it's a great success. I think people definitely love it. Um, but, you know, it would not be me if I didn't say that we need to continue to focus on equity, equity and prioritizing our most distressed streets throughout throughout the West Side. I think I've said this to you, Kimi, before. Uh, when it's 102 degrees at 7th Street in Osborne, it's almost 115 degrees at 75th Avenue in Osborne. So de definitely, there, there's a huge difference, and whatever we can do to be helpful with this, I, you know, that we will always be there to to help out and, and do what we need to do. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Ansari. And then we'll go to Councilman DeCicio after Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also want to start off by thanking uh, city staff, um, especially for your diligence in completing 80% of this and just 60% of the time. Um, props to you. I want to give a big shout out to the sustainability components of this program. Um, the fact that we've saved 9,500 tons of materials um, that would have otherwise been waste is truly phenomenal. And obviously, there's no question that the Cool Pavement Program and the fact that it's the largest in the country is really phenomenal and innovative. Um, I will obviously be supporting uh, this motion, and I would love to expand the program, but um, I have the same um, hope and desire to see um, more equity as we expand these programs. I know, you know, with the infrastructure bill and just various funding opportunities that we might have from the federal government, there, I'm sure we can find more funding to expand the cool pavement program. And I'd like to see that invested in areas where we've historically disinvested. Um, and as Councilwoman Guardado said, are, you know, areas that are much hotter as a result of that infrastructure and the lack of infrastructure. Um, but very excited, grateful for the new bike lanes as well. I think that's a huge step in the right directions when it comes to transportation options and accessibility. And I hope that street safety will continue to be top of mind as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in our district, um, you know, we had uh, the the accident and that, you know, downtown and, and we see lots of accidents like that in Levine as well. Um, so I was just wondering also if there's any way, if it's possible to see traffic reports and incidents um, and how that's including, how that's included in determining what local and residential streets receive priority. Um, if, if that's possible, that would be greatly appreciated as well. But thanks so much for all your hard work on this. Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank Mario and Keeney for all the hard work that they do at the streets department. I know it's a really tough job, and it really is, the amount of work that they put into it to do the best that they can with such limited resources. I think my comments are more in a general way. Uh, when you look at streets, they're infrastructure, but they're the first thing that we see when we enter a city. And we're driving on a street, and it's bumpy, and it doesn't feel right. That is our first impression, that, or that is our long-term impression of the community that we live in. It fits in line with the um, broken window uh, theory that came out many years ago, that if you go into a neighborhood and you see a broken window that's never been repaired, then you start to have doubt about that neighborhood and it eventually creates a decline. Just one broken window in a, in a neighborhood in the community can create a decline. We still have a lot of streets that need to be repaired, a lot. I mean, I'm telling you, just drive on that New York street, and you'll see the one, we've done a good job with what we've done, but we have so many more that need repair work and they need to be upgraded. If you want to see a community get better, whether it's an equity issue, as some of the council members have talked about, or it's just literally an investment issue from our community, I think we really need to have that. Uh, we have so many dollars that have come in from COVID that we could use for streets, I would hope we could, because that infrastructure will pay dividends long term. One, the neighbors in that community will see an increase in their property values, but also, also you will see an increase where people start to feel good about the community that they live in. Not that they don't, but eventually those deteriorations become over time. It literally, if you start to see a deterioration occur in anything, it takes a little bit of time, you start getting used to it. And we should never get used to 
our roads and our infrastructure not being in full repair. And so I know there is no specific way or plan right now in place to resolve all of this because we've got thousands of miles that still need to be done. But as a council, if we don't focus on infrastructure and getting whatever extra dollars we've got, we're going to have problems long-term as a city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any additional council comments? Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, like everyone, really thankful of, um, of the work that's been done um, and just uh, trying to encourage a little bit more. I got a couple of questions around uh, what the community process was and, and what that looked like in different districts. And I'm not asking you all to, to bring that up now, but just seeing, you know, maybe working with our offices to be more intentional about that. Um, and, and to Sal's point, um, I think thank you for, for, for trying, but I, I think this is actually the opposite of the broken windows theory. It's the aesthetic domino effect, which is if we beautify our cities, then more good will come. And so I think if, if we think about it in the positive, we will continue to do good work, especially really excited about um, the climate practices and the cool pavement. Um, and thank you, Mayor. We got to get, we got two in, in District 8. Um, and so excited to, to figure that out along with the, the bike path as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is uh, wonderful to see this investment, but I, I did want to draw attention to Mario's comments earlier about the gas tax. We have to modernize the way we fund transportation in this state, relying on a very outdated gas tax does cause real problems. Uh, in this case, it was sales tax dollars that were moved to pavement, but we have to look at funding sources that make more sense, and I hope we'll see some creative thinking and results out of our state legislature. There have been significant efforts to update state transportation funding. Situation is even more difficult for our rural communities. And um, I would certainly like to see continued effort in that area. It does appear that there is some bipartisan momentum. So maybe we can take this as an example of you can get things done across uh, party lines and, and hope that the same will happen at the legislature. One thing I did want to draw attention to is uh, a program that the Streets Department had had where we have people go out proactively and um, in addition to the pavement maintenance plans, we have people who are looking at the right of way and really trying to make sure that our system of investments is not dependent solely on who is calling in, but also real information gathered out in the community and people who are going out and observing. We've seen that some communities have higher rates of calling in than others, and we've we've tried to address that. So. Uh, wanted to recognize Keeney and the whole team who put that program together as well. Um, I think we're doing, we got still work to do, but doing better with uh, looking at equity in our investments. Where are people walking? Where do people need cool pavement? We had a great investment in this budget in trees with an equity lens there as well. And all of that is working together to make this an easier city for everyone to get about, regardless of the mode of transportation that you choose. Uh, I join my colleagues who'd love to see the Cool Pavements program expand. Now when I am out talking to people in the community, they are already starting to ask, when is it my turn? And I hope we'll be able to say soon and give people dates to in even more uh, parts of our city. Uh, it's been a good news and, and we want to have more cool neighborhoods. So thank you for the work in that area and, and all the work we're making it to make sure that uh, we have the have a very strong transportation system in the city of Phoenix. All of these investments work together. Uh, we do have a motion on the table um, from Councilwoman Cl uh, Stark. So I, um, for our city clerk, do we need a roll call on this one? Yes, Mayor, I would recommend a roll call vote. All right. Then we will go to roll call on Councilwoman Stark's motion. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. Yes. Guardado. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. 
Yes. Waring? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. Wonderful. Congratulations, and thank you to all those out there paving our city. We next move to agenda item two emergency rental assistance program, which is part of the American Rescue Plan Act uh, expenditures. We will turn to Deputy City Manager Gina Montes. Hey, our members of the council. This afternoon, we're here to discuss the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, known as ERA, and our recommendations for additional rental and utility assistance as part of the American Rescue Plan Act funds, known as ARPA. Uh, presenting along with Assistant City Manager Jeff Barton is Human Services Director Marshall Franklin, Water Services Director Troy Hayes, and Housing Director Titus Matthew. We're going to review the status of, of ERA-1, including a discussion about the improvements to the program many of which were recommended by you and your teams. Second, we're going to discuss our plans for the ERA, pro ERA 2 program and timing. And finally, we'll provide our recommendations for the ARPA rent and utility assistance, which will enhance our service to the services to the community. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize the work of the Human Services Department staff and our partner organization, Wildfire and their partners. They have been working hard uh, for months, both under the CARES program and also ERA, to provide critical assistance to our residents. And I want to thank them for their commitment to the community. With that, I will turn it over to Human Services Director Marshall Franklin. Thank you, Deputy City Manager Montez. To recap our coronavirus relief fund efforts in May of last year, our City Council approved $29 million in federal funds for emergency rent, mortgage, and utility services. And with those funds from last year, we were able to serve 6,200 households. Specific to our current program, which is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or ERA 1.0, City Council approved $51.1 million in federal funds in March of this year for rent and utility assistance. To be eligible for this program, you must be a Phoenix resident and an income at or below 80% of area median income. For an example, a family of four, the area median income at 80% is $63,200. You also must have qualified for unemployment or have a reduction in income due to COVID-19 as well as demonstrate a risk of homelessness or housing instability. Just recently, the U.S. Department of Treasury, which administers the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, recognized the City of Phoenix as a benchmark city for effectively dispersing our funds and implementing a best practice of incorporating experienced local community action representatives to assist with solving program challenges. In an effort for our public to see where we are at on expending these funds, an ERA dashboard was created. It is updated weekly, and as of August 30th, we have expended over $32 million, which is 70% of the allocated program funds for ERA 1.0, which has served over 4,200 households, which represents over 10,700 residents, and we are currently distributing approximately $2 million each week in ERA 1.0 funds. While wanting to distribute the funds as quickly as possible, Phoenix experienced similar challenges early on, as did other cities, with application completeness and staff resources. We heard very, very, very clearly from our city council and our community uh, with the significant frustration regarding the process uh, and with your guidance and recommendations, Mayor and City Council, we have addressed those challenges, which I will outline over the next few slides. First, a consultant was hired to evaluate the ERA program process. One of the findings was that the document collection phase was taking 80% of the total application processing time. As a result of this finding, we created a document center that was activated on August 20th. 
This processing center will eventually have approximately 50 additional staff whose sole function will be to work with applicants on collecting all necessary documents. We also recognize the need to expand our hours of operations. So effective Monday, September 20th, our hours of operation will change from Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to Monday through Saturday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Also, in evaluating the program process, it was clearly identified that income verification was a choke point, if you will, and especially, and especially a challenge for our applicants, which delayed in providing much needed assistance. To eliminate this problem, staff created in partnership with the Maricopa Association of Governments an income by proxy tool to verify income. This tool takes public data, from the U.S. Department of Urban Development and the U.S. Census Bureau regarding average incomes in a household geographic area, also called a census block group. If 60% or more of the population in a specific census block is at or below 80% of the area median income at the time an application is submitted, that household is considered income eligible and no additional proof of income is required. Also, with the eviction moratorium ending and meeting the needs of residents at immediate risk of eviction, the city has partnered with a law firm that represents landlords to provide services for residents who are scheduled for a lockout from their home or an eviction hearing. Since implementation at the end of July, 930 residents have been contacted and 53 households have been served with just under $415,000 of assistance, eliminating their immediate eviction. We currently use Saturdays for these contacts. We have also been told, specific to this partnership, that the City of Phoenix is the only ERA program in the state with this type of unique partnership with a law firm. And finally, with the recent release of updated program guidelines from the Treasury Department, our process now includes self-attestation for the requirements of proof of financial hardship, risk of homelessness or housing instability, and income verification. Again, staff truly appreciates the input from the City Council and our community on how we can make this program even more effective in meeting the needs, both rental and utility, for our residents. Also, I do want to share that the City has been in discussions with this last week with the Arizona Department of Economic Security to open up its portal to our Phoenix residents. We are working through details such as ensuring both programs have substantially the same benefits as we want this option to be seamless for our residents. Now for ERA 2.0. The City of Phoenix has been allocated for ERA 2.0 55.3 million dollars in federal funds. Staff are currently in discussions with Wildfire regarding implementation of ERA 2.0. This will be a seamless trans transition for our residents from ERA 1.0 to 2.0, and the city will still have at its use the Wildfire online portal to serve our residents in ERA 2.0. Because staff have distributed funds very quickly for this program, meaning ERA 1.0, it is anticipated that those funds will be fully expended by the middle of October rather than the original target date of December 31st, 2021. As such, ERA 2.0 could be launched in November. And now Assistant City Manager Jeff Barton will outline recommendations for use of ARPA funds. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marshall. Mayor, members of the council, as you know, on June 8th, 2021, you approved our ARPA strategic plan for our state and local fiscal recovery funds. That was a $198 million plan. In that plan, you allocated $10 million specifically for us to augment and enhance our emergency rental assistance program efforts. And so we're here today to walk you through our proposal to use that $10 million that you allocated on the, under that plan. 
First, we would allocate $4 million to provide additional assistance to those households that fall outside of the guidance that's provided for under the current emergency rental assistance program. That's specifically those individuals that have an AMI above 80% to 120%. Um, Marshall will provide some additional details behind this, but this is a group of, of individuals that we're constantly hearing from and hearing about, especially from certain focus groups like the Multi-Housing Family Association. We would also like to use $5 million of that $10 million um, to allocate towards um, helping our residents that have city services bills, those that are in arrears, to help bring them current. And Troy Hayes will walk you through those, those plans. And then finally, we've got $1 million that was set aside in this plan to help incentivize landlords to rent to individuals needing Section 8 housing. And Housing Director Titus Matthew will provide the details on that. First, we'll move to Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Barton. As our Assistant City Manager mentioned, staff proposes to use this $4 million to serve those with household incomes between 80% area median income, which for a family of four is $63,200, and 120% of area median income for a family of four, which is $94,800. We do propose that the same guidelines that we used for ERA, I'm sorry, for both our ERA programs will be the same guidelines that we would want to use for this particular program. Um, we also believe that being able, as Assistant City Manager Barton mentioned, focusing on those who are between the 80% and the 120% AMI will allow us to serve those that we still know have a very significant need uh, and something we also heard from a lot of the industry associations. Now Water Services Director Troy Hayden will discuss the next recommendation. Thank you, Michelle. Mayor and Council, as you recall, during the onset of the COVID pandemic, the Water Services Department restored the water services to all resident, residential customers. At this time, no single family residential customer accounts are shut off or under a low flow device unless they're involved in a water theft case. Additionally, Single Family Residential Deferred Payment Arrangement Program, or the DPA, was launched. The program allowed existing delinquent customers to defer their balances and future monthly charges to a future date and would allow for up to 12 months to pay back the full amount. The Water Services Department has not enforced revenue in over 19 months, and the city is currently the last city in the valley, and I'm not aware of another city in the state um, that isn't moved back to enforcement of revenue. Enforce revenue enforcement is vital to maintain our bond covenants as well as the health of our utility. We are currently operating under a $9.5 million deficit for single family residential customers. This number has grown, as you can see, from March of 2020, where it's historically around $2 million. But we have a plan. The city is proposing to utilize $5 million of ARPA funding to establish the Deferred Payment Arrangement Recovery Program. Starting on October 1st, 2021, the customers enrolled in the DPA program would be eligible for ARPA funding if they pay one third of their outstanding balance in accordance with their payment plan. After the third balance was received by the Water Services Department, we would apply the ARPA funding to the remainder two thirds to pay the customer's deferred account in full. Only accounts enrolled in the DPA program would be eligible for the recovery program. Currently, the average balance for a customer that's in the DPA program is somewhere around $537. In this example, we will utilize Wayne Drops account, and I will step through the DPA Recover program for Wayne. On October 1st, the customer's balance on the DPA program is $537. One third of the balance, or $179, is distributed into four equal payments, increasing their monthly bill by $44.75. This will be applied to the October, the November, the December, and January bills. In January, once the $179 is received, the department will then directly apply the remaining $358 to pay the deferred count balance in full. This slide will outline the timeline of events associated with the Deferred Payment Arrangement Recovery Program. If approved, letters would be sent to customers enrolled in the DPA program outlining the payment schedule starting October 1st and the use of ARPA funds with their accounts. 
Letters will also be sent to customers with outstanding balances not currently enrolled in the DPA program, encouraging them to contact the Water Services Department and to sign up for the program. As I stated earlier, only accounts signed up for the DPA program will be eligible to receive the ARPA funds. On September 30th, the Deferred Payment Arrangement Program would be suspended and the Payment Arrangement Program would begin. Disbursement of the ARPA funds would begin once one-third of the balance is received by the Department. If a customer does not pay the account in accordance with their payment arrangement or is not enrolled in the DPA program and continues not to pay, those accounts would be enforced by installing either a low flow device or eventually a shutoff. These dates that I've shown here represent the earliest possible of the actions. I believe that the program will directly help our customers that have it struggled while allowing, us, while allowing the utility to keep investing in the operation and the aging infrastructure while maintaining our bond covenances. Now I'll turn it over to Titus. Thank you, Troy. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. To recap and refresh your memories, Council approved the use of $500,000 in housing CARES funds in August 2020 to be used for a landlord incentive program. This program was rolled out by the Housing Department in September 2020. Today, I'm pleased to announce we have expended $491,000, or 98% of the $500,000 allocated. In addition, I'm pleased to report that due to your direction and support, the landlord incentive program has brought in 127 new landlords and retained 855 current landlords. This is a significant milestone in terms of adding new landlords to the Section 8 program. Due to the success of Phoenix, other cities such as Mesa, Chandler, Tucson, and Maricopa County have copied and implemented a landlord incentive program too. Based on the success of this program, we recommend continuing this program with an additional funding of $1 million to incentivize current and potential new landlords. This will entail paying each landlord $500 as an incentive or bonus payment for every 12-month housing assistance payment contract. This will help our Phoenix Section 8 voucher holders to retain and find new housing options in this high-cost rental market. Next, I'm turning this presentation back to Deputy City Manager Montez. Mayor and Council, we're requesting uh, your approval. Our recommendation is to utilize the $4 million to expand the ERA program income criteria to 120% of area median income, to utilize the $5 million to implement the Water Services Deferred Payment Arrangement Recovery Program, and finally, to utilize $1 million to continue the Landlord Incentive Program. And with that, we're available for questions. Wonderful, thank you. And I do believe we have one member of the public to address the council. So why don't we go ahead and go uh, to a request to speak and we will begin uh, with Rola. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. You can hear me, okay. Yeah, I... Um... Actually, I want to thank you for um, having me uh, here today to talk about uh, my experience. I uh, I really appreciate what uh, um, Wildfire and what the um, city of Phoenix did uh, to help support my family. I'm a single mom with uh, um, a teenage daughter, and uh, I got uh, help from... Uh, um, uh, refugee uh, organization, CARE, and um, uh, the lady was helping me. Her name is uh, Lena, and um, she uh, helped me to um, to get all the documents and um, all the information they needed for um, supporting my, um, to help me pay for my bills and uh, for my rent. I was behind on the APS because I was out from work um, from COVID. I got affected from it and um, got uh, out of work. So uh, they helped me twice and I really appreciate that I was getting evicted from my uh, my uh, 
a house and uh, I'm renting and um, I was behind on my uh, APS and City of Phoenix water bill. They support me a lot. I do appreciate that. Thank you so much, Roland. Thank you for raising your daughter in Phoenix. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, and thank you for sharing your story. And for our staff, do we have anyone else uh, who requested to speak? Uh, we have one, a uh, Vanessa Davenport. And All I've right. been informed that... she's not on the line. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And, and uh, again, thank you to Rola for sharing her story. Uh, let's see. So we have a suggested motion and we will open it up for a motion and council member comments. We go first to the vice mayor. Thank you, mayor and, uh, and, and the staff and. And everyone who's worked really hard on this. Um, uh, obviously, I want to take, thank the human services department for making some changes that are going to allow for the program to help more people. I also want to thank my colleagues in district four, five, and seven for uplifting issues of our constituents over the summer. Um, and I hope that we can continue to improve these programs so we can help more people stay in their homes. I still feel a sense of urgency to protect tenants uh, across the city, especially um, with the federal mor moratorium ending soon. Um, I do want to thank staff for, for working alongside with us and, and being more creative. On our end, we're going to be doing a resource fair and eviction prevention that our office is, is helping host alongside with, with the human services staff. It's gonna, we're going to try to do our first one by September 18th, so we'll let folks know when that's happening. Um, but with that, I'm, I'm excited about the changes. I'm excited about where we're going. Um, I, I really do think uh, we need to do a good job of explaining specifically the water bill. Um, so looking forward to either some social media, some one pagers, maybe using the water bills themselves to send a, a detailed uh, plan of how, how that program is going to work. Because I do think it, it, that's the one that's a little complicated. Um, but beyond that, really excited and uh, mo motion to put forward uh, staff recommendation. Second. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Councilman Stark, for the second. We'll go next to Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in you know, I think first want to give a thanks as well to the Human Services Department. Um, my office, um, alongside Vice Mayor Garcia, have had the opportunity to be in regular contact with the office um, this summer to review opportunities for improvement. And I think the ongoing financial consequences of this pandemic have no doubt been unprecedented and the demand of these funds have put a huge responsibilities on the shoulders of the team. So very appreciative for staff's collaboration. Also want to take a moment to thank the Wildfire CEO, um, Cynthia Zwick, and her amazing staff for partnering with the city on this huge undertaking. Um, I agree the situation is urgent, and I think looking at the stats of the current situation, with over 1 million confirmed cases of COVID in Arizona, with more than 235,000 of these in the city of Phoenix, today also marks 19,000 COVID-19-related deaths in Arizona. We know that the Supreme Court has ended the eviction moratorium, and we haven't even yet felt the consequences of that. Um, I've read reports that 36,000 residents in Arizona are actively in fear of eviction, so I'd be very interested to see how many of those residents are our constituents. We can only imagine how destabilizing this, um, this pandemic continues to be for families, so I'm happy to see more funds going to this. Um, I do have just two questions specifically regarding rental assistance. Um, and I guess the first one is I'm wondering how staffing changes and updates to some of the application information and processes have affected the completion of applications. And then number two, with the eviction moratorium ending, do you see on top of the additional staffing that's been proposed how are we remaining agile? Does the city foresee the need to possibly hire any additional staff? Um, and maybe what other measures are we taking to, again, continuously improve this process um, as we foresee the, um, the impacts of the moratorium? Thank you. Mayor, Councilwoman Ansari, um, 
I will say in terms of ad additional staffing and remaining agile, we, we definitely will continue to monitor the needs um, as we, we fully staff up the additional uh, 50, approximately 50 staff will be adding. There may be a need to, to add additional uh, uh, team members. We just have to, to monitor um, how the impacts with the, the different changes to the program will happen. And um, with that, I'll have uh, Marshall address kind of the specifics on the application and the changes in that process. Thank you, Deputy City Manager Montes, um, Mayor Gallego, and Councilwoman Ansari. If you don't mind, I was taking some notes and I got to your third question. Can you, if you don't mind, restate your first question so I can make sure I'm being responsive to your question? Sure. Um, I was wondering how staffing changes and any improvements that have happened, you know, maybe while we were not in session, what effect you saw in the applications, um, the completion rate of those? Thank you for that. Yes, we have seen a significant increase in our ability to be able to process the applications. We have heard from our applicants uh, as we were making some of these changes in the midst of them working through the process with us, uh, how beneficial it was for them, especially when we started talking around the things, the income uh, by proxy process that we put into place, as well as we heard very clearly from some of our applicants, their appreciation for the fact that we are working very, very, very closely with them. And if you will, really taking the time to explain in details what, what is needed, as well as being very creative about that. And then finally, I will say that I'm not only for us within the city of Phoenix, but across the valley, the ability to fully self-attest is making a significant difference. And again, we have heard from our applicants that the fact that all they need to do, if you will, while in the midst of dealing with this type of crisis, is to provide a self-attestation about something is one less stressor, if you will, that they have to deal with as it relates to everything surrounding this pandemic and the impact that it has had on individuals, especially around their income. Council Thank you so much. And Councilwoman Ansara, the only other thing I would add to what um, Deputy City Manager Montez and H Human Services Director Franklin said is, again, we continue to negotiate with DES, so that would be uh -huh. yet another avenue for our residents to actually participate and get um, assistance. So, again, in terms of addressing the moratorium and speed and, and being agile and staffing, having DES also processing applications on behalf of Phoenix residents would also help us significantly. Got it. Um, and then I forgot to ask my... My last question, this one's for um, our new housing director, Titus. Uh, first, I just want to give him a huge shout out for really hitting the ground running um, and happy to hear that your, um, the landlord, um, you know, incentive programs and outreach has been very effective so far. Can you tell me more? Is there any sort of, I guess, elaborate more on some of the outreach programs to landlords and how equity is being evaluated in that outreach? Thank you. Councilman sorry, thanks for the question. So currently, under HUD guidelines, we, one of the goals we have is to deconcentrate poverty in Phoenix. But generally, all our Section 8 voucher holders reside close to light rail, public transit, and different areas within Phoenix where housing is an affordable option. Especially with the HUD payment standards that we have, we have raised our standards in the last few years, and effective January, we're going to 105% of the HUD standard. So we're hoping with that we can leverage with different organizations and outreach in terms of marketing. We also post, uh, landlords can advertise on socialserve.com, and we also outreach through our internal programs, our listservs, trying to reach as many landlords as possible about this incentive program. So the goal is to deconcentrate poverty in Phoenix from a HUD perspective and also to reach out to landlords all over town. So that is the goal of the housing department. But in addition to that, we do market to different entities and organizations about the program. We also have flyers we sent out to all our clients and our residents who receive them too. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I, so I guess like my first question, just to, just to be clear, and if you can just either um, Gina or Jeff, if you can just um, refresh my memory, um, the, is the money that we're talking about, is it new ARPA money or is it from the 198 that has not been allocated? 
That's a great question, Councilwoman. Um, Mayor, members of the council, the, the $10 million that we're talking about using to augment the existing ERA program comes from the 198 that you approved on, on June 8th. So we have not yet gotten to a place where we're talking about the second tranche of ARPA dollars. Okay, great, great. Thank you for that. Um, so in, and I think um, I've spoken with a couple of you about this. Um, after after we send the letter, so some my colleagues and I send out a letter um, to Ed outlining some of the concerns. Um, and Councilwoman Ansari has addressed um, some of those concerns um, that we had um, that we heard from the community. And you know, as you know, we've also heard a lot of those concerns into our office. And I see um, some of the things that we're doing to try to remedy some of those issues. Um, and I wanted and I wanted to put some ideas out there, like what are some of the methods that I think that we could be using um, to be able to accelerate this even a little a little bit more. I do think that maybe we should bring the funds um, into the community, like doing like some satellite offices and the different um, community centers that we have um, where residents could come in and apply in person. Um, we still have a lot of constituents that do not know how to use, do not know how to use a computer or have a hard time accessing, accessing this information online. And I think if we were able um, to provide these services um, in person, I think that this could go a long way. I know that we have challenges in terms of being able to hire more staff, um, but I wanted to ask, like, what would that process look like, and and what is it um, that you guys would need from us um, to be able to make those satellite offices happen? Thank you, um, Councilman Guardado. In terms of the the in person offices, we currently have our, our lobbies open so that those who, who really can't do it over the phone or online can, can bring their documents in person. We are currently looking at um, the, the numbers in terms of COVID and, and when, what it would be like to bring people back. So our first priority right now is to staff up the document center just to increase capacity overall. But in terms of, of looking at the family services centers and, and bringing those back online, we're open to doing that um, when we when we deem it's kind of safe in terms of COVID and and once we get the the staff up and going. Um, Marshall, did you have anything to add? Okay, Marshall. Did, okay, sorry about that. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Councilman Guardado, did we get? The information that you needed, or should I go to Councilwoman Pestor, or do we have more? Yes, questions? yes, no, I'm good, thank you. All right, Councilwoman Pestor. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for their efforts. Uh, we have helped 91 households between July and August. I do think we need to accelerate uh, the help because the moratorium's ending at the end of the month and uh, feel like we can probably serve more people. Um, I am asking on behalf of several constituents these following questions. Uh, the rent relief hotline, which I tested today, rings busy all day today. Today isn't Monday, but I know Monday we had a day off and, and today is Tuesday. So is there any way that people can leave a message and get a return call? Um, I sat at least in between my meetings calling and just receiving busy messages. I'm assuming that they're probably calling in order to get a, uh, an appointment, but, and I called uh, 534 aid. My other piece is, are the agencies that are contracted by wildfire required to maintain a minimum staffing level or is there a weekly production quota put into place in their contract? Will additional staff go to the individual agencies once they are hired to help those in those agencies that are receiving um, a lot of applications? And then what is the security measurement 
or vetting process for volunteers reviewing, reviewing personal data? And do you know if a caseload per agency is being, being spread out or could some agencies be overloaded while others are not? And how is that monitored and who manages those pieces? Is there any communication systems between the agencies? Um, with the six month backlog, have we looked into contracting more agencies? Um, and the other piece is that the conversation that I've been having with uh, AMA, uh, the Multi-Housing uh, multi Association, is that there's great frustration out there, out in the communities uh, with renters, but also with landlords not being able to uh, apply and get on to uh, assist for rental or provide rental assistance once the renter has signed off on it. Uh, what there's some miscommunication or misperception or the uh, or there's misperceived conversations regarding DES and uh, I have had those conversations with uh, several people in the industry of what the dynamics the push pull me with DES is going on what I would like to know is what are we asking DES and are they willing to do it? So those are all my questions. I can start from the top again. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, I, this is Ed. I'll, I'll start with the DES question because I've been exchanging letters with the director of DES. Very simply, what Phoenix asked was for DES to open its portal to Phoenix residents. That was it. When, the, when they started the program at the beginning, the state did not allow Phoenix, Mesa, Chandler, Tucson residents to access the state portal because their reasoning was that those communities had, had their own funds, which is their prerogative. But as we got into it, um, we asked DES, would they open their portal to Phoenix residents as well? They responded a couple times with different responses, but basically it boiled down to, they, they ended up saying they would be willing to do that, but only if we closed our portal through wildfire, which we re rejected as an idea that it would be providing less access to Phoenix residents rather than the goal, which was more. Now DES, in talking with uh, Ms. Montez and Mr. Barton, has uh, agreed to talk to us about uh, opening their portal to Phoenix residents without the precondition that we close our, our own portal. So that's where the DES matter stands. So it's still in negotiation. So we, we're not, we're unsure if the portal will open. That's, that's correct. We're still okay. in conversation with them. That's correct, Councilman. I have two more pieces. Um, the moratorium uh, ends September 30th. Is there any way, can we start the new hours before 920? Um, I think there's gonna be a floodgate and we'll be back at the same spot, um, I think in 20 days. Uh, and then my other piece, is there any way to be updated on an application status for people waiting? A constituent called, uh, actually called a Councilman DeSizio's office, and then it uh, ended up in my area because they're my constituent, and has not heard uh, from anyone since April, and they applied in April. So I guess my question is with, with that, what is the process and uh, how do we keep up and monitor all this data and who is, who is responsible, um, on what entity who is responsible to basically make sure that everything is uh, meeting its goals and um, outcomes. Um, Councilwoman Pastor, let's start with the, the question on the application status. Um, the, each um, agency kind of has their, their caseload of who they're going through. And I, I believe they can call and, and get information on their application. Um, but it is true, we do have people in the queue. 
and you know we're kind of getting to those um, each agency as it goes through the, the city of Phoenix we have kind of our process that goes week by week and then the other um, agencies through wildfire um, they're fielding calls on their on their own as well for those um, cases that they have on their own um, I want to go back to the the hotline and um, hold on just a moment oh um, sure my question um, so what I heard is that the city has one process, wildfire has another process, um, and probably wildfire under their subcontractors subcontra have another process. Um, and so my understanding is when they get a status update, they're given an email, they're given an email saying, please contact this person. If I am already in crisis and in this, in this queue and I desperately need rental assistance and say I can't email or do all these things, I am now frustrated and upset because I don't have somebody really walking me through this whole process. So I really think we should look at how we're administering our process in order to make it tight and move uh, fast and quickly. But thank you. Right, um, Councilwoman, um, going back to the, the question on the, the hotline, um, I'm going to have Marcel discuss that the, this issue, um, there shouldn't be a continual busy signal. We're not sure what was going on. We're going to look into that, but, but why don't you go over the, the, in general, how it works. Sure, Mayor Gallego and Councilwoman Pastor, as Ms. Montes stated, that should not be occurring. So I already made a note and uh, quickly sent a text message to staff uh, to look into that. You still should be able to ring. Uh, I do need to verify what the capacity is to leave messages. So we will follow up on that immediately. Uh, as you uh, mentioned, our phone line in terms of the availability of appointments, you do call on Monday morning uh, and we take appointments until they fill up for a week. But to your point, that should not be happening. That phone line should not be giving a busy signal. Uh, and so we will follow up on that immediately. Councilwoman Pastor, Mayor and Council, um, the next question I believe was related to mini minimum staffing levels by the agencies that are working with wildfire um, and their, um, their staffing level and funding. Um, wildfire has relationships with each of those uh, nonprofit organizations that are serving the public. Um, each agency has, uh, has, you know, has negotiated that with wildfire and and their level of staffing is dependent on the amount of funding received and the administrative cap, um, I believe is 10% of 10% and which enables the, the hiring of the staff. Um, the, the contract with wild, wildfire um, stipulates the amount of funding there to distribute and, and the deadline for that funding, which I believe is December 31st of this current year. Um, it is not um, specific as to a certain number per week or um, or a certain you know a certain number of households it's just the the procedure that kind of has been laid out um, the other piece of that is that um, the, the the process and procedures that we have in terms of the the, the dollar amount and and the specifics of how people are, are served um, at a broad level are are the same ones that that the city of Phoenix staff are using and, but that as far as the specifics, um, a quota, that all depends on the, the dollar amount of each agency. Um, Councilwoman, you had also asked a question um, concerning if we were looking for other organizations um, to, to take on funding. And the answer to that question is yes. Um, Wildfire um, and has reached out to other organizations. Um, currently, I believe there's 16 um, nonprofit. Is that correct or is it 13? Well, uh, apologies. Um, it's wishful thinking that it were 16. We have, uh, we have um, 12 nonprofit organizations that are serving the public. They have um, tried to um, 
find additional organizations willing to take on this work, and um, I believe there was one they were looking at um, recently, uh, but we have not, um, you know, in concert with Wildfire, found additional organization at this time. We, we continue to, um, to try to identify more capacity in the community to serve those who, who need the services. Um, in terms, you want to answer the moratorium? Um, in terms of the the um, the hours and changing the hours um, m to be much sooner, um, I will say that when when we're making a schedule change with our employees, um, we do have to give them notice and to make sure that that their arrangements can be made with their own families um, and changing their hours, say from you know to Saturday. Uh, hours and just a different schedule, different hours. We did need to give our employees notice. So as much as we'd like to move it up uh, at this time, um, the the September 20th date is is the one that we've worked with our employees on, and and um, and we need to to hold to that at this point. So my last question was, what is the security measure or vetting process for volunteers reviewing personal data? Thank you, um, Councilwoman Pastor. Um, I'm going to turn this one over to Marshall to discuss the, the vetting process. Uh, Mayor Gallego, Councilwoman Pastor, currently the City of Phoenix does not have any volunteers that are working on our emergency rental assistance program. They are all city staff, either employed by the City of Phoenix or temporary agency employees. We are all required to go through a fairly extensive background check uh, just based upon your interactions with what's defined as vulnerable populations. As it relates to wildfire and their subcontracting agencies, uh, I need to check specifically uh, to see if there's language that identifies that, uh, but I do know that the nonprofits that wildfire is working with have the same requirement in terms of backgrounds when you're working with vulnerable populations. Uh, I am not clear of volunteers working at the nonprofit agencies that Wildfire contracts with, but we will follow up on that uh, as soon as we conclude this meeting. So, Mayor, can I? Please. Um, the purpose and the reason why I'm asking is because uh, as the constituent came in front of me today, uh, we have been working their case and uh, found out that uh, it is by volunteers. Some of the volunteer there are volunteers working. It may not be on the city side, uh, but we do have this uh, contract or IGA or, or I don't know what we want to call it uh, with the other agency. And so I think it's important to know uh, if there is a vetting process um, regarding volunteers reviewing personal data and what, what it is. Uh, Mayor Gallego and Councilwoman Pastor, uh, if you don't mind, would like to, to talk with you after the meeting or have staff talk with your staff so that we can work in partnership with you, in particular on the one applicant, but specifically to be able to also follow up on uh, volunteers uh, through wildfire subcontracting agencies and the vetting process uh, that is in place for that. But we, we would yeah. like to follow up with that one particular applicant that you had in front of you as well. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just working, I feel like I'm working the case. I'm a case manager right now, uh, working the case and, and helping the constituent get through this difficult process and making sure that there is success at the end of the tunnel. Um, but in working this case, uh, I see where the, the ups, highs, lows, and the pitfalls of this process. And it could be cumbersome and understand why people then give up. So, but thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. We ought to make the program as good uh, and continue to make investments, but I think it's also important to recognize what we're doing today, which is making this program available, this and other programs available to thousands more people in our community. The 4 million will help us open up eligibility for more individuals, including some who may not have qualified 
based on income earlier and it'll make it easier for there to be a solution depending on what your income is. And then I'm so glad the housing department is moving forward with making section eight work better for more people and, and getting more landlords involved in, in all parts of our community. Also, just as we thank the people who were paving our streets, want to thank all of the people who are doing this work. In my previous political uh, before running for office life, I did some work with uh, utility assistance programs. And even when you are able to deliver the aid, it can be exhausting. And just such hard work when you're talking to people who are worried about providing vital services to their families and, and you feel for every person who calls. Uh, the success stories are wonderful, but it's hard, hard work. So thank you to people who are doing that. And it sounds like we are hiring. So if there's people who've had a success, gotten rent relief and, and want to get involved with bringing it to more people, our nonprofit partners, and we may have opportunities in that area. I um, want to thank our nonprofit partners as well as our city contractors and, and city staff for continuing to do this work. I think uh, for some of them, it has gone on longer than they expected, and they're still stepping up trying to help us process these applications with ever-changing rules, although at least in this case, improving rules and making it easier for people to work with. So thank you to our many partners. Any final comments before we go to a vote? And and Denise, um, do we need to do a roll call on this one? Mayor, you can do either one, voice vote or roll call. Wonderful. All right, then we'll just do a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please signal, signal nay. Passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you so much.